Welcome to this new study on the books of Joshua and Judges. Joshua and Judges have not typically been in the forefront when churches are looking for Old Testament Bible studies. Of course, there are still some great children's stories here about Joshua and the walls of Jericho, Samson and Delilah, or Deborah, and of course Gideon. But the narratives of God-sponsored genocide in Joshua can be off-putting for today's Christians who contrast them with the love thy neighbor God we hear about from Jesus. And the Justice League style adventures we read about in the book of Judges may often seem a little outmoded today. Why should we bother to read, much less study, these books in the 21st century? Why are these books even in the Bible? Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit in this session. Who wrote these books and why? What message do they have for us today? We'll also introduce an author of a redactor identified as the Deuteronomist. But first, we begin with a prayer. Oh God, our Father, open our eyes and enlighten our minds as we study your word. So grant that our minds may know your truth and our hearts may feel your love, and then confirm and strengthen our wills so we may go out to live what we have learned. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we're going to start with some of the mechanics of this class. The study is 12 weeks long. Once a week, we'll post a new pre-recorded session of the study on Northgate's website. One, each session will be about 30 to 35 minutes in length. You can watch it any time that it's convenient for you. On Monday evening at 6.30 p.m., there will be a follow-up Zoom session to discuss the current week's study session. If you have signed up for the follow-up Zoom session, we will send you instructions on how to connect to the session. The first discussion session will be Monday, April 8th at 6.30 p.m. You do need to sign up in advance to participate in the Zoom discussion session. If you haven't signed up yet, you may send an email to online.classes at northgateumc.org and say you want to participate in the Zoom discussion session. That email address is also on the website. Any Bible translation you have will work for this study. At different times, I will be using different translations, but for the most part, they are all very similar. So as it turns out, I'm not an expert on these two books from the Old Testament, so I will be using several sources or commentaries over the course of the study. My primary sources are Joshua 1 through 12, a new translation with introduction and commentary by Thomas B. Dozman, the book of Judges by Mark Zevi Brettler, Moses and the Deuteronomist, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges, a literary study of the Deuteronomic History, Part 1, by Robert Polson, the Hebrew Bible Translation and Commentary by Robert Alter, especially we'll be looking at Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges, and also Joshua by Richard D. Nelson. You do not need to buy any of these books. If you have a copy of the Old Testament Bible with you, that will be helpful. The ideas I will be presenting will primarily come from these sources, although I won't always tell you which source I'm using in any particular moment. I'll also occasionally post handouts on the website that offer some supplementary materials. And we begin with Joshua 1, the first five verses. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, the updated edition. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the Israelites, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and the Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea in the west shall be your territory. No one shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. So we have begun reading from Joshua, but don't get too excited. We're going to read a few more verses from Joshua in a couple of minutes, but not much more today. We will read the first two chapters of Joshua in session two. Right now, we're going to back up 
and orient ourselves. We have more about a dead Moses in these first five verses than we do about Joshua. Before we talk too much about Joshua, we need to discuss a little bit more about this Moses. We also need to talk about how Joshua came to be at the banks of the Jordan River and a little more about this people that the Lord is giving the land to. So this is a background check. The first five books of the Bible are often called the Torah or the Pentateuch or commonly the five books of Moses. Traditionally, the author of the first five books of the Bible was thought to be Moses, hence the five books of Moses. The complication that Moses died in the last few verses of Deuteronomy could be accounted for by explaining that Moses was merely writing down what he had, had been dictated to by God, or perhaps that someone else came along and wrote the last chapter. In any event, these five books have normally been thought of as a unit, the Torah, which means the teaching or sometimes the law is given to Moses. The first book, Genesis, is kind of an origin story. It's divided into two main parts. The primeval history, which includes the creation, Adam and Eve, Noah's Ark, and the Tower of Babel, and the patriarchal tales, which is the story of Abraham being called to the promised land in Canaan, his son Isaac and grandson Jacob, who are considered to be the patriarchs. God changed Jacob's name to Israel, and Israel's sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. At the end of the book of Genesis, Jacob and his sons and their families go to Egypt. At a time of great famine, Jacob, now called Israel, dies. The other four books of the Torah tell the story of Moses, many generations later, leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, where they had become slaves. We have the story of Moses, the Hebrew people, wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. God gives them manna to eat and the law to guide them. And just as they reach the east bank of the Jordan River, ready to go back into Canaan, the promised land, their leader, Moses, dies. This exodus from Egypt, the wandering in the wilderness, and the giving of the law make up the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The book of Joshua is intended to be the conclusion to the story of the exodus and the wilderness journey. It also appears to be a transitional book between the Torah, or the Pentateuch, and the former prophets, which include Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. Interpreters have suggested two primary theories of composition, depending on whether Joshua is read more closely with the Pentateuch or with the former prophets. Those who claim it fits closely with the Pentateuch suggest we have a hexateuch, a sixth book set, which includes not just the escape from Egypt, but the fulfillment of the divine promise of land. In Joshua, God finally gives the promised land to Israel. Those who focus on the setting of the former prophets interpret Joshua within the Deuteronomistic history, which includes the books of Deuteronomy through 2 Kings. We'll discuss the Deuteronomistic history a little later in this session, and again in session two. Now we're going to go back to Joshua. We'll skip a few chapters and read from chapter six. Joshua and the Israelites have surrounded Jericho. Following the instructions from God, they have been blowing trumpets and circling the city for six days. Chapter six, beginning with verse 15 through verse 21. On the seventh day, they rose early at dawn and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who were with her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers we sent. As for you, keep away from the things devoted to destruction so as not to covet and take any of the devoted things and make camp of Israel an object for destruction, bringing trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. 
As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpets, they raised a great shout, and the wall fell flat down, down flat. So the people charged straight ahead into the city and captured it. Then they devoted to destruction by the edge of the sword all in the city, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys. I'm going to read that last verse again. Then they devoted to destruction by the edge of the sword, all in the city, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys. So this isn't the only time they completely wiped out an entire city and killed all the men, women, and children. They did it over and over again at the Lord's direction in the book of Joshua. We will see war and battles and killing again in the book of Judges and throughout the whole Old Testament. But it's here in Joshua that we can most clearly see God's sponsored genocide. How do we reconcile the Lord's call to wipe out entire cities in Joshua with Jesus' call to love thy neighbor in the New Testament? The books of the Torah, as well as Joshua and Judges, are written as histories. That is, they are designed to tell us how the people of Israel came to be in the land of Canaan or Palestine and how they survived as a nation without a monarch, a king, for many, many years. Yet these books also use literary devices. That is, they tell the historical narrative in a particular way, using a variety of literary techniques that are also designed to give the author's readers a message, perhaps a theological message, that might not be obvious if the narrative was composed of a simple series of unedited events. Historians have a viewpoint that can be expressed in their selection of episodes they choose to write about and the perspective they use to tell their stories. It may be that trying to discern the message the writers or redactors of these narratives was trying to convey will help us understand why we see this picture of God as a mass murderer in the book of Joshua. Over the 12 weeks of this study, we will look at how literary devices, techniques, and structures may shape the message. At the same time, we'll point out the diversity of opinion among modern scholars about how we should use apparent literary techniques to interpret these ancient writings. The first six weeks of this study, we're going to focus on Joshua. The first 12 chapters of Joshua narrate the invasion of the Promised Land, beginning with the commission of Joshua in chapter 1. This part of the book narrates the destruction of the king's royal cities and the indigenous population. The invasion takes place in two stages. The first, Joshua 2 through 8, focuses on the procession of the Ark of the Covenant from Shittim on the east side of the Jordan River to its resting place at the mountains of Ebel and Gerizim near Shechem on the west side of the Jordan. The second stage, Joshua 9 through 12, 12 recounts the wars of Joshua against the northern and southern coalitions of kings, resulting in rest from war in the land. The second half of the book of Joshua describes the redistribution of the land to the tribes. The process begins in Joshua 13 with the tribal regions east of the Jordan, including the territories of Reuben, Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh before the focus shifts to the western region in Joshua 14 through 19. The allotment of the western lands includes Judah, the two tribes of Joseph, Ephraim, and the half, other half of Manasseh, and the remaining seven tribes of Benjamin, Simon, Simeon, Zebulun, Ishkar, Asher, Naphtali, and Dan. Joshua 20:21 20, clarifies that only appropriate cities in the Promised Land are judicial centers of refuge and religious centers. The final chapters address the topic of ethnic identity and the social and religious exclusion of indigenous nations. Ultimately, we learn of the death of Joshua. The identification of the author or authors of Joshua has played a central role in the interpretation of the book since the early 19th century. Interpreters have long noted conflicts in themes and motifs which suggest a history of composition by different authors. The central theme of the conquest, for example, remains unresolved in the book, with some texts indicating the extermination of the king's royal cities and people, and others stating that the indigenous nations remain in the land. 
Our primary source for the first 12 chapters will be Thomas Dozman's commentary. For the second half of the book, our primary source will be the commentary of Richard Nelson. We will, however, introduce some analysis from Robert Polson's book on Moses and the Deuteronomist and Robert Alter's translation and commentary. In the last six weeks of the study, we will read the book of Judges. Judges is a strange book in many ways. Joshua dies twice in the book. Many of the judges are really anti-heroic. It's a mixture of genres. Most of the stories are relatively long and focus on single individual, but at two points we find judges noted in little more than lists, and such fascinating information as he had 30 sons who rode on 30 burrows and owned 30 burrows in the region of Kiliad. Some of the stories are quite fantastic. Some we'll look at more we will look at more closely than others. We'll compare Uid, Athenal, and Shamgar stories. There's a whole series of Samson stories. The Deborah stories are composed of a combination of prose and poetry. Finally, we'll have the gruesome tale of the concubine of Gilbah. Here we will primarily follow Mark Zevi Brettler's book, The Book of Judges. Uh, but once again, we'll allow Robert Polson and Robert alter to weigh in at various points. As with Joshua, it appears the stories and judges were not all written by one individual. We hope to ask some questions about the original source or sources of the book of Judges. What do these stories mean? Why were they written and preserved? Why were they collected together in one book? Is there a unified theme? If so, what was it? The idea of multiple authors for a single book in the Bible is not unique to Joshua and Judges. We're going to close with an example from Genesis, the creation story. I'm going to read from the first chapter of Genesis through the first part of the fourth verse of chapter 2. So try to pay attention to the order of creation here. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was complete chaos, and the Darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there were, was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants, yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants, yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule by the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind, with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply over the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, 
cattle and creeping things, wild animals of the earth and of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humans in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have domain over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps upon the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And so it was. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth, sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitudes, on the sixth day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth and when they were created. So I want to point out a couple of things about chapter 1 before we go to the rest of chapter 2. The Hebrew word for God in chapter 1 is Elohim, usually translated to God in the English translations, although you may occasionally see Elohim, depending on who, who did the translation. One other thing we saw in chapter 1 was that God's actions mostly involved saying or seeing things. God said, let there be light. God saw the light. God called the dome heavens. God blessed the humans. There were a couple of occasions where God made or created something. He made the dome. He made two great lights and placed them in the dome. He also created the great sea monsters. But mostly he just said something and it happened. There is nothing here about God getting out a shovel or a hammer and nails. He just said, and so it was. So now we're going on to a second story of the creation. The last part of verse 4. 4 of chapter 2 begins a new story on the day God made earth and heaven. Notice we're still using the words God, earth, and heavens. The order of earth and heavens, however, has been reversed. Instead of heaven and earth, it is earth and heaven. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, no vegetation of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise up from earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So we have God fashioning man and breathing into his nostrils. God is not just saying or commanding. He is acting. God has become a craftsman here in this story. From the cosmic overview of creation, we have gone to the nitty-gritty God getting his hands dirty. Verse 8, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is Fishon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Havilah, and there where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Beldelium and Ankston are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. 
The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat it, eat of it, you shall die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall over the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife. They become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now a short word about syntax. The first story of creation uses standard biblical partaxes. God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and it was evening, and it was morning, first day. It is just and, 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 no subordinate or coordinating clauses. It doesn't say God noticed it was dark, so he created light, and then he thought it would be a good idea to separate the light from the darkness, because he realized it would be difficult to sleep in bright sunlight. It's just one clause after another without a subordinating conjunction to link them together. I know it may have been a while since we had English grammar and we learned all these things about subordinating clauses, but that's what this is. The second creation story uses what is called hypotaxis with long, complex sentences. The section we just read from the second part of verse 4 through the end of verse 7. On the day the Lord God made earth and heavens, no shrub of the field being yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not caused rain to fall on the earth, and there was no human to till the soil. And wetness would well from the earth to water all the surface of the soil. Then the Lord God fashioned the human man from the soil and blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and the human became a living creature. Clearly different syntax, another indicator that this could be a different author. It is clearly a different style of writing. The term used in the second story is made, not created, as it was in the first story. And the term for God in chapter 2 is Yahweh Elohim, or Lord God. Elohim used in chapter 1, beginning here in chapter 2, the author uses Yahweh Elohim which may be translated as Yahweh God, or Jehovah God, or Lord God, most frequently. From this very first phrase, we see this is a new story from what appears to be a different author. Modern scholars of the Torah have identified four principal literary strands, each representing a different author or group of authors. J, which is the, called the Yahweh strand, E, the Elohas strand, P, the priestly strand, and D for Deuteronomy. We'll talk about these next week, especially the Deuteronomist strand. We will read some from the book of Deuteronomy and look at how some modern theories tie it in with Joshua and Judges. We're going to talk some more about the Deuteronomist. We will also read and discuss the first two chapters of Joshua. I hope you can join us for our first discussion on Monday evening, send an email to online.classes at northgateumc.org to get the Zoom link. Have a good week.